connections that this has to computer science. So, you know, we often look at solving an auction, we assume there's a common prior, and we worry about the incentives. And here, this is a different take in which the designer doesn't have a, an assumption about the information available to the agents. So, we don't know what other people know about each other. So, how can we design an auction that is robust to any sort of information structure that the other agents might have about each other's values and still do things like maximize revenue. Um, so I don't know if that's your take. <laughs> but, I don't know if you might have that. So uh, we think you know, it, it has beautiful connections to this field because there's this worst case aspect and yet um, it's uh, very popular in economics. So thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Nicole, for inviting me and, and for the introduction. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, present a few papers with uh, different sets of co-authors uh, at a very high level that are part of a, a research program that's sort of implementing the, the concepts that Nicole was describing. Uh, so uh, I want you to, uh, so the, the papers that I'm going to talk about are a little bit more general, but to, uh, to fix ideas for this talk, let's think about the, uh, the canonical single unit allocation problem where there's a fixed set of bidders and, and they demand a single unit of a good and there's a seller who has a single unit for sale. And uh, these bidders have a pure common value for the good and uh, we actually know what the distribution of that common value is and otherwise the, the model is entirely standard. The agents have quasi-linear utilities. And you know, typically in, in auction theory, there are a few different questions that we're interested in. This is not meant to be uh, comprehensive, but at the very least, you know, we're interested in characterizing bidding behavior in specific mechanisms, and we're interested in making welfare comparisons across uh, auction formats. And then finally, you know, we're, we're interested in what are optimal auctions to use, you know, for whatever objective, revenue maximization, social welfare maximization. And uh, all of these, uh, the answers to these questions depend, of course, not just on F, not just on the data that I gave you at the top of the slide, but they also depend on what the bidders know about the value. And uh, the standard modeling approach in game theory uh, has been to uh, conduct this analysis with respect to a fixed model of information, which is represented as a Harsanyi type space. So what that is is every uh, agent has a set of signals uh, that are informative about the value, and there's a joint distribution over those signals. And uh, you know, that, that distribution in certain benchmark cases, it could be independent, but in general it can be some uh, correlated joint distribution over the signals. And then uh, the, there's a correlation structure between the signals and the value so that the bidders know how to uh, interpret their signal in terms of a conditional distribution over the value and uh, the other's signals. And in this common value world, we can summarize all of that correlation structure with a function w, which is just the conditional expectation of the value given all of the bidder's signals. Uh, now, uh, there are a few problems with uh, analyzing uh, these auction theoretic questions with respect to a fixed type space, which is that, you know, we, we don't really know what the right type space is, you know, which one is uh, empirically relevant, and uh, uh, that would be okay if all type spaces were giving us the same answers in terms of how people should behave or comparisons between mechanisms or how to design optimal mechanisms, but they, in practice, they give us very different answers. So it's, uh, uh, and, and which of these answers should we trust uh, is, is not so clear. So I think, um, in economics and, and in CS, I think there is a, a shared desire to get predictions out of our models that are going to be robust to misspecification of, of the inputs, in, in this case, uh, the information. Uh, and uh, an approach uh, that I have observed implemented quite a bit in, in AGT is uh, to uh, conduct a model misspecification analysis with respect to the distribution of the value. Uh, although, you know, I think, uh, I think you know, that's just one of, one of many approaches that it could adopt, but that's a, that's a frequent one. And uh, the approach that I'm going to talk about today is on the flip side, actually. Hold fixed the value distribution, but conduct an analysis uniformly across models of information that are consistent with that value distribution. And uh, I just want to reiterate that for this exercise, we're holding the distribution of the value fixed. Uh, and, uh, and we're only considering that those information structures where this W of S uh, is such that the F that's an input to our problem is a mean preserving spread of uh, the distribution of W of S, okay? Now th this actually, it, it may sound like a, a messy problem to 
be analyzing auctions over such uh, a large space of information structures. You know, it's a very high dimensional space. We haven't even said, you know, where these signals have to live. We haven't uh, narrowed down, or their cardinality. We haven't limited the, uh, the correlation structure. But, but actually, uh, in many ways, th this kind of analysis ends up being more tractable than the standard approach because uh, it basically reduces to linear optimization problems over, over a set of correlated equilibria. And uh, so I'm going to tell you about three papers uh, that uh, take this uh, angle uh, to uh, auction theory. And um, uh, so the first one is about making predictions about bidding behavior in a fixed mechanism. And this is a, a joint paper with uh, Stephen Morris and, and Dirk Bergman uh, that was published last year. And we're going to look at, you know, the, uh, in, in, in many ways, the most canonical, uh, probably best studied Bayesian game in all of game theory, which is the first price auction. Uh, so suppose we were to run a first price auction in this environment, no reserve price. Uh, so, you know, the good is always going to be allocated to someone, as long as uh, the, the good has a non-negative value to the bidders so that they'll want to participate in the auction. Uh, so actually, no matter what happens, uh, social surplus is, is going to be the same. It's going to be the expectation of the value because, you know, we assume that there was a common value. So it, efficiency doesn't depend on who gets the good, just on whether someone gets the good, okay? So no matter what, total surplus is going to be the expected value, which is denoted b hat. Uh, so the interesting question to ask would be, how is that surplus going to be split between the seller and the bidders? And we'll let R denote revenue and, and U denote bidder surplus. And of course, you know, as, as we've been saying, the answer to that question depends on how we model and, and what assumptions we make about the information of the bidders. For example, if all of the bidders knew exactly what the value was, well, then they would basically be in Bertrand competition with one another and they would compete the price up to, uh, up to the value and uh, bidder surplus would be zero and, and uh, R would be equal to V hat. R is, R is ex ante expected revenue. But of course, if the bidders have private information, then that won't happen. And in general, the bidders are going to get positive rents. Uh, and exactly how much depends on, on the model we use. Uh, but importantly, revenue can't go down to zero. Okay? And, and to see that, you know, if revenue were going to be zero in a first price auction, it would have to be that all of the bidders are bidding zero with probability one. And, and then any bidder could deviate to bidding epsilon. And you know, there's got to be some bidder who's winning with probability less than or equal to 1 over n. If you bid epsilon, you'll win all the time. And you only have to pay a tiny bit more. So that suggests that there, that there is some non-trivial uh, lower bound on revenue and some non-trivial non lower bound on, on how low bids can go. And, and that's essentially what we characterized in this paper. So it, it turns out that actually, in order to characterize revenue, it, it's actually uh, easier to characterize or, or, or uh, a useful intermediate step is to characterize what distributions of winning bids could arise in an equilibrium. Okay, and it turns out there's a, there's a clean answer to that question. So in, in particular, any Bayes-Nash equilibrium in any type space is going to induce some distribution over a winning bid. We'll call that H. And there is some set, curly H, of all of the winning bid distributions that could arise in some Bayes-Nash equilibrium for some type space that's consistent with this known distribution of the value. Okay? And uh, a, a main result in our paper is that actually that set is very well behaved, and it has a smallest element. What do I mean by smallest element? I mean it has a smallest element in the first order stochastic dominance ordering. So there is some H lower bar such that for any uh, equilibrium winning bid distribution, H, H will first order stochastically dominate H lower bar. So, which is quite surprising because, of course, first order stochastic dominance is a partial order on uh, distribution. So it's not surprising that there are minimal elements, but the fact that there is the smallest element that's smaller than everything else is, is a little bit surprising. But once we have that result, that immediately tells us that actually there is a well-defined minimum revenue in the first price auction, which is just the expectation of the winning bid with respect to this minimal winning bid distribution. And we're going to call that the revenue guarantee of the first price auction use that terminology in the future. So uh, let me tell you just a little bit about what this uh, minimum winning bid distribution is and, and where it comes from. And it actually has a kind of intuitive description. There is a particular type space, and there is a particular equilibrium that generate that H lower bar, and it looks like this. The bidders get independent signals, which are real numbers, and they're drawn from F to the 1 over N, 
But remember, f was the distribution of the common value. So why f to the 1 over n? Well, that distribution is chosen so that the highest of these signals has a distribution f, the same as the common value distribution. And in fact, the, these signals, even though they're independent of one another, they're correlated with the value so that the value is equal to the maximum of the n signals. Okay, so the bidders are getting these signals, which are random draws, in, independent draws from f to the 1 over n. For a realized signal profile, you just look at the maximum of those signals. That actually is the true value. So the bidders end up, end up learning exactly what the value is if they pool their information. So that's the information. And what happens in equilibrium? Well, it turns out in this type space, there is an equilibrium of a first price auction where the bidders bid as if their signals were their true values. Okay, of course, they're not. You know, your signal is just a lower bound on the value because it might be that other signals are higher than yours and then other signals would, would be equal to the true value. The highest of the other signals would be equal to the true value. But nonetheless, in this equilibrium, the bidders use the same strategies as they would in an independent private value model where values were drawn from f to the 1 over n. And uh, uh, so that gives us an interpretation of h lower bar. h lower bar is the distribution of the winning bid in a different model where bidders have independent private values such that the highest value has a distribution f. Okay. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the techniques that we use to prove. So that proves that you know, this particular h lower bar is in uh, curly h, the set of equilibrium winning bid distributions, but it doesn't prove that it's the smallest. That actually comes from a different argument that shows that this, this h lower bar is a pointwise upper bound on the cumulative distribution uh, that you could get in equilibrium. And that comes from looking at a particular class of uh, incentive constraints that we call uniform upward deviations, which says, uh, suppose you as a bidder were to deviate by bidding the maximum of B, some fixed B, and whatever you would have bid in equilibrium. Those deviations can be used to put an upper bound on the distribution, which is attained by this construction. Here's an example. Uh, when the value is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, then this h lower bar is also a uniform distribution between 0 and n minus 1 over uh, parentheses 2n minus 1. Uh, and in the limit, as n goes to infinity, uh, this uh, revenue guarantee of the first price auction converges to a quarter. So in the limit, the seller is, is guaranteed to get 50% of the total surplus from using a first price auction. And in general, this minimum revenue is bounded away from the expected surplus. So. Um, the next uh, paper that I want to talk about is a more recent one, a working paper. Uh, you, so the second bullet on, on my list of, uh, of uh, uh, popular questions in auction theory is how to compare welfare across mechanisms. So one way to use this technology would be to compare auction formats by their revenue guarantees. And uh, there what we have to say is the following. So I'm going to compare first price auctions actually to a, a wider class of mechanisms that includes first price auctions. I'm going to call a mechanism standard if it has one-dimensional bids, if the high bidder wins the auction, and if when we look at this auction in the, in the symmetric independent private value model, there's a monotonic equilibrium, meaning that the outcome would be efficient. So second price, uh, English auctions, all pay auctions, uh, various uh, combinations of those would all be standard mechanisms. Theorem, any uh, standard mechanism has a revenue guarantee that's lower than that of the first price auction. So it's kind of remarkable. This is a, a foundation for using first price auctions uh, over those other standard mechanisms because in some sense uh, the first price auction is more robust to model misspecification or misspecification of information than those other mechanisms. And uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the logic behind this result, but as you can see, it's actually the proof of this result is very short and it's much shorter than uh, the proof of the lower bound for the first price auction. So if we were actually just interested in comparing first, and, and uh, first price auctions to second price and English auctions, there's actually a trivial answer about what the uh, revenue guarantee should be of those other mechanisms. You know, second price and English auctions have these uh, collusive equilibria in which one of the bidders bids an enormous amount and the others bid zero. And since we're looking at all equilibria, you know, that's in the set that we have to have this uh, revenue guarantee over, and, and we could have trivially concluded that uh, uh, SPA and EA have uh, revenue guarantees of zero. This seems a little bit unfair to uh, the SPA and, and the English auction, I think, because you know, there are benchmark environments where we know that second price and English auctions have 
pretty natural, compelling monotonic equilibria. So what if we tried to be a little bit more generous to those mechanisms and restrict attention when we compute these revenue guarantees just to informational models that are symmetric and uh, affiliated? So in other words, staying within the model of Milgram and Weber. And in that, you know, within that restricted class, we can compute what we'll call an affiliated revenue guarantee. So if we do that, it turns out that first price, second price, and English auctions all have the same affiliated revenue guarantee. So there's a kind of affiliated revenue guarantee equivalence. So overall, you know, this kind of, uh, and, and the argument here is, is actually quite simple. Um, you know, for all of these environments, Milgram and Weber show that second price and English auctions have to generate weekly more revenue than the first price auction. Uh, and this uh, worst case for the first price is, uh, is an affiliated values model. Uh, so that means that, uh, you know, actually the, we know what the affiliated revenue guarantee is for all these mechanisms, and it's exactly equal to the unconstrained revenue guarantee of the first price auction. So the last uh, paper that I want to tell you a little bit about is, uh, you know, natural next question is, well, what is the optimal revenue guarantee? Right? You know, we, we sort of computed it for a fixed mechanism. We compared the first price to a few other standard mechanisms. What's the best you could do? And what are the mechanisms that attain that optimal revenue guarantee? So these are kind of optimally informationally robust in this very coarse and demanding notion of informational robustness. Song Zidu has a, has a beautiful paper where he shows he doesn't compute the optimal guarantee for any fixed N. But what he does is he constructs a sequence of mechanisms and a sequence of lower bounds on the revenue guarantee uh, that converge to the expected value as n goes to infinity. So to put that in context, remember that the first price auction has a revenue guarantee that only converges to 50% of the surplus in the uniform case. And in general, it's bounded away from, uh, efficient, from the total surplus. Nonetheless, these mechanisms are guaranteed no matter what the sequence of informational models is and no matter what the sequence of, of Bayes-Nash equilibria is, as you take n going to infinity, uh, the revenue guarantee will converge to full surplus at a rate uh, of 1 over log n. So I have another paper with, with Stephen and Dirk that looks at the binary values model, uh, sorry, that looks at a two-bitter and, and binary values model and computes the exact uh, optimal uh, revenue guarantee. And then in a more recent paper, with uh, uh, Songza, uh, we computed the optimal revenue guarantee for general N and a general F in this common value environment. And uh, we solved it for a case where the seller has to sell the good and where he doesn't. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about what these maximum mechanisms look like. Uh, when the good has to be sold, sold, uh, sold blah, blah, blah. when the good has to be sold, you should do the following. Uh, first of all, and, and you know, I don't have time to sort of emphasize this adequately, but it's, the, the mechanism is very low dimensional. You, know, you might think that what the seller should do is something like ask the agents what the informational environment is and then just you know, run whatever the optimal mechanism would be given what, what the agents report. And that would be very high dimensional. You know, the agents have to commute, uh, co communicate their higher order beliefs about, uh, about their value. Uh, you don't have to do that there is a kind of natural bidding mechanism that attains the optimal guarantee. Bids are non-negative numbers. The probability that a bidder gets the good is their bid divided by the sum of the bids. So this proportional rule attains the optimal revenue guarantee. And the transfers uh, have an explicit formula, although it's a little bit uh, messy to state, so I'm not going to do so here, but they're a nice continuous function. If you bid zero, you pay zero. And, uh, and it turns out that the optimal rate that you get to this full surplus result is root n. So you can tell me if that's better, significantly better than log n. Uh, and uh, I, I, I do want to say it again, that you know, this result is obtained for all sequences of type spaces in equilibria as you take n growing large. So there are very weak assumptions about information going into this. And, and actually, even if you misspecify the f, you'll still get to the optimal revenue guarantee. So somehow misspecifying the distribution of values doesn't matter when, when the market is very thick. So here's a kind of gratuitous picture of what uh, this proportional rule looks like when there are two bidders. And uh, for, uh, of course, bids can be any non-negative number, but uh, this is for bids up to five. And this is what the transfer rule looks like. So very, very uh, well-behaved, in, in this case, actually, differentiable function. Um, here is uh, the final picture I want to show you for the talk which is a plot of how, uh, what the revenue guarantees look like 
for various mechanisms as a function of n. So the number of bidders is on the x-axis and, and uh, revenue of the seller is on the y-axis. And the, blue cir the red circles are the revenue guarantees of the mechanism I was just describing, the optimal one where the seller has to sell the good. And uh, blue stars are unconstrained optimum when the seller can also withhold the good. Uh, and uh, there's actually a, a Bulow and Klemperer style result in this environment which says that actually the revenue guarantee with uh, n plus one bidders if you have to sell the good is always greater than the n bidder revenue guarantee if you can keep the good. And you can see that here as the blue and, uh, and stars and red circles keep leapfrogging one another. And then uh, these uh, uh, crosses are the mechanisms that Sangza constructed in his paper. The triangles are the first price auction and this is what you would get with a posted price, the optimal posted price, which uh, doesn't depend on n. So that's about what I wanted to say. Uh, it's a, uh, I think, a new modeling approach in auction theory. Uh, and it uh, turns out that by analyzing mechanisms not in one informational environment, but in lots of them, we actually make the problem simpler and, and more tractable. And we get results that are robust to model misspecification. Uh, but I, you know, I think the, re the results thus far are, are, are you know, there, there is a bit of substance to them, but um, more than anything else, it's a proof of concept that this is a tractable modeling technique that I'm hoping others will uh, build on. And I think there are a lot of interesting questions remaining in this research program. Uh, one is, you know, we've constructed particular maximum mechanisms, but understanding the set of maximum mechanisms and looking for particular instances that are especially tractable or, or intuitive uh, would, be, would be quite a valuable addition. Uh, and corp how do we incorporate additional information about the tight space? You know, I think a weakness of this theory is that we have to have such a huge set of informational environments, many of which are probably not uh, ones that we should be that concerned about. And then uh, one other thought is, you know, how do we, you know, this this, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a schizophrenia in this model that, you know, the seller is, uh, has ex this extreme concern about model misspecifications, but the bidders, they know exactly what the informational environment is. And that's an assumption that, that really should be relaxed as well. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. And that's what I had to say. Imagine varying the distribution. Sure. I mean, I think that this is a, an input into an exercise where we also vary uh, the value distribution. Um, I think uh, you know, I, I'm I'm also concerned, you know, as you guys are, about misspecification of the F. And I think that uh, something that makes me a little happier with the results that we get is that getting F wrong actually doesn't seem to matter too much. You know, for example, the loss goes away as n becomes large. And you can actually prove something even stronger that these revenue guarantees, if you misspecify F, uh, that you, know, you can compute a, a misspecified revenue guarantee that's actually uh, linear and weak star continuous in the true distribution. So, but but you know, I, I, I definitely think that the work gets stronger if we can, if we can do more to uh, uh, vary F. Thank you. Thank you.